Changing Lanes, the official podcast of BMW. Hello and a very warm welcome to this episode of Changing Lanes, the official podcast of BMW. I'm Nikki Shields. And I'm Jonathan Tilly. And today on the podcast, we are talking, well, we're talking basically about a thing. Uh, we're mm-hmm. going to give you a few clues <laughs> yeah. to see if you can guess. <laughs> um, it's basically a something that is always inside of your car and it is absolutely vital for you to be able to drive it. And it's on every car. It's on old cars. It's on new cars. It's on cars with plenty of technology. It's on cars without too much technology. Exactly. Very mysterious. It's something that your hands are on the entire time when you're driving. Well, (laughs) at least we hope so. (laughs) You should be getting close now. I think that's that's a pretty good clue. Um, But I would say it's, I think it's something so obvious that is always right under your nose. You don't really realize it's there. It's not something that you really take notice of, do you? Have you guessed what it could be? (laughs) Hmm. Well, if you've guessed correctly, today we are talking about steering wheels and not just steering wheels, but also steering and control technology and all of those awesome options to control your car. You know, I know it's not really glamorous and it's not really interesting. And it's a thing that we don't really talk about because it's just so obvious, isn't it? It's such a given when you're driving. Yeah. It, it's it's so obvious that it's it's definitely the unsung hero or the underdog <laughs> when exactly. it comes to innovation. You don't think steering wheels, oh, innovation. You just think, oh, it's just right there. It's a steering wheel, right? It's not something you talk about, is it? When you've just got a new car, you're like, so what's the steering wheel like? (laughs) Exactly, exactly. (laughs) Well, I've never asked that anyway. (laughs) Neither have I, right? So, I mean, and think about it. I mean, my very first car, when I had when I was 16 to drive back and forth from home to high school, it was so basic. I mean, I'm surprised it lasted that long as it did. And (laughs) and even even the steering wheel in that very basic car was just a round thingamajig with a horn in the middle and that was it. It it was Mm -hmm. not glamorous at all. But, you know, if you jump cut to today, where steering wheels have these amazing cockpit like functions that they honestly make you feel like you're flying a spaceship and you're not just driving a car. I mean, we've jump cut from when I was 16 years old to now. And it's something that I still don't really think about when I get into my car, I'm not thinking, ooh, the steering wheel. It's just a given. It's so obvious it's right underneath our noses. Totally. It is actually amazing how much technology has changed because before, the steering wheel was really just there to steer the car. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that was it. I, I remember, yeah, mine, I mean, I had a, um, I'm going to admit this live. Yeah, I had a Nissan Micra. I loved my Nissan Micra. <laughs> um, and it had a very basic steering wheel. It was grey, it was big, and it had a horn. And that was about it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, never thought any, anything more of it, really. I never really wanted anything more from my steering wheel. But uh, yeah, as, as you mentioned there, Jonathan, they have come a very long way. Yeah. And they do. They need a bit of appreciation from they time do. to time. <laughs> because actually, particularly now, you know, with all of the functionality that cars have, um, you need that functionality at your fingertips because you want yeah. to be able to keep your hands on the steering wheel. You know, you don't want to necessarily be stretching across to the centre console. You want to be doing it right in the cockpit, as he called it. And it's just Mm. amazing. It's full of innovation. It's this real tech hub. Um, But what we want to talk about today is the journey of it. You know, where did it all start? Let's, you know, sort of rewind, remind ourselves of where that transition started to happen. And also, why did it start to happen? How did the state of art, the multimodal control elements that are obviously um, they're actually in the new BMW iX, for example. But how did they get there? How did they find their right places? And well, that's what we're going to be just discussing in this session. Um, but to do that, it is time to step back in time, to step even further back to past when Jonathan was 16 years, years old, which was obviously <laughs> just a few years ago. Um, it was last week. It was yeah, last yeah. week. Shut, shut, shut. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm so rude. Um, it's not like I was 16 yesterday either. Um, but yeah, we're going to go back in time, 100 years, and revisit a series of innovation and highlights um, that really help us to tell the full story. So Jonathan, kick it off. Let's rewind. All right, let's rewind. Let's go back almost 100 years ago, where all stories that, you know, They got to start somewhere. So the year was 1929, and the very first BMW, the 315, it saw the light of day. 15 horsepower in 1929, (laughs) right? And this is where it all began. So, of course... 
typical of its time, the steering wheel was pretty simple. Like like you and I said, Nikki, when, when we were younger, the steering wheels were really simple, and that was less than 100 years ago. So really go back 100 years, it was super simple. So the steering wheel, it took up so much of the driver's view, it was huge. And if you look at photos of the uh, BMW 315, and if you look at photos from the outside, you can look into the windshield and see like the rounded, huge steering wheel from the windshield that's inside if you're standing outside and looking at it. It was just massive, this big round object. And it was supported by a simple dashboard, nothing fancy, and centrally placed ignition. Super basic. Now, you and me, Podcast listeners, imagine being behind that big wheel and navigating the roads. I mean, it must have felt like that <laughs> steering wheel was more like steering a large ship than a car, right? Totally. And it wasn't easy because there was uh uh-uh, no power steering back then. So I think that was, you know, the reason it had to be so big. So you could actually turn it and, uh, and, and negotiate corners. And obviously you had equally exactly. large, very narrow wheels as well. It was not easy back then. Although you only not had 15 horsepower. So <laughs> you're not exactly going to be bombing it down the highway. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But, you know, even with this massive steering wheel, one thing was clear. Already at an early stage, focus was put on drivers and their needs, something which would come to play a crucial role in the years to come, not just in the years to come, but also in the future from today and onwards. Exactly. So let's fast forward a little bit. Let's move to the fast paced 70s and actually more specifically to 1972. Now, this was a really interesting year for BMW, particularly when it came to design and engineering, because it was this year. Um, yeah, one of the motor shows that BMW introduced the world to an absolute classic. It was a show car. It was a demo car. It was a concept car. It was the 1972 BMW Turbo. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about here, I would highly, highly recommend you go to BMW.com, look up this article. It should be on the homepage. If it's not, go for the search um, button and search controlling your car because it is a phenomenal looking car. It's got these pop-up headlights, gullwing doors. It's sort of wedge-shapey. I mean, it is a car that you would want to be seen in, even in this era. <laughs> it's very cool. <laughs> um, but this was kind of the birth of the driver orientated instrument panel, um, which of course we now are so accustomed to. But yeah. this is sort of the first time that it was the introduction of this driver orientated cockpit elements, I suppose, because suddenly the interior was there, not just for you and your co driver, your passenger, but it was all about the driving position. You know, yeah. how can we get this technology um, and really cater for you as the driver? Uh, so it's kind of shifted all those elements towards the direction of the driver. And I think this was also a moment in kind of history of design that actually all the cars were built for the driving experience. And, you know, there was a shift of attention towards the driver behind the wheel, uh, which was a really important moment. So basically already in 1972, way back when, uh, this was really the first appearance of something that shaped BMW, you know, interiors for years to come. And we're seeing it now. It's it's such a um, poignant thing, isn't it? When you get in and, and all the buttons, all the dashboard, all the um, screens are angled towards the driver. And it's something that I particularly love, I've got to say. But it was 1972 when it first came about. <laughs> Crazy, right? And and this this is what where I just go, whoa, this is so cool. And talking about, you know, making it a all about the driver's experience. Going back to 1929, where that massive, you know, ship of a steering wheel was was there and it was just taking up so much space. Just having the idea of tilting the steering wheel, shifting it, that it's more easy for the driver to use, this just makes sense. I mean, think about it now. When we go into cars and we put our hands on the steering wheel, it's already that's already happened for us. We can even sometimes shift the actual wheel that it's the perfect position. So this groundbreaking move in 1972 where they shifted the actual placement of the wheel, this is huge. But it didn't stop there. Moving on to 1994 with the launch of the third generation of the 7 Series, the E38. Now, BMW took things one step further, bundling absolutely everything any driver in the world would need in one single place right at the tip of their fingers. Now, this is when the introduction of buttons on the steering wheel itself happened in 1994 with the flagship 7 Series, and it gave drivers full control of everything. Now, this was monumental. 
You could go for entertainment. You could do phone calls. You could do cruise control. You could switch between driving modes and many more customizable options. Nowadays, we just take it as normal. But in 1994, this was huge. Now, the E38 was also the first BMW with the, <clears throat> let's get ready for a German lesson. Even this is tricky for me to say. The Drehdruckknopf. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, please reveal, what is the direct translation of that one? The the, the direct translation is uh, twist press button. Okay. Um, but it's it's more well known in English as the twist and push knob, um, which was a forerunner of the iDrive controller. So Got once it. again, Drehdruckknopf. I mean, even me with my German, that's a tongue twister. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, this uh, twist and push knob was, it was used to control the first display screen used in a BMW for navigation and also for handling menu selections. Now, all of these concepts would later find their home in the fully fledged iDrive concept only seven short years down the road, which, Nikki, you're going to be chatting about that in a little bit, which I'm super excited to hear about. Um, but like, like I said before, this solidifies once again the driver's first approach as you could say a trademark of BMW interior design philosophy, if you don't mind me getting too intellectual here. We're, <laughs> it's totally about making it all about the driver and what they need right at their fingertips. It allowed BMW owners to focus on what really matters, keeping their eyes on the road and their hands on the wheel without any unnecessary distractions, no matter their driving needs or whatever. It was all about safety and making it all about the driver. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? Just thinking back to when that first came around, you know, I think I remember um, a time getting in, I think I was at school and I got into someone's car and they were like, oh, we've got cruise control. And it was yeah. like, what? What is yeah. this piece of technology? What? How does that work? And it was like, what wizardry is this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember my grandfather, when he bought a new car and it had cruise control on the steering wheel, I was like, <laughs> Are you Dumbledore? Like, this is so cool. <laughs> was Harry Potter around back then? <laughs> um, it, it, was, it was a cultural reference. A cultural reference. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, we, we'd love to hear from you guys, actually. To all of our listeners, do you remember the first car that you got with buttons on your steering wheel? The other thing, of course, remembering, you know, voice control or, yeah. you know, d doing a voice control and also particularly, obviously, with BMWs, doing your hand control. To, to get things moving and, you know, turning up the music, for example. I used to love doing that. It's like wiggling your finger to turn up the uh, volume of the music. Um, but talking about when voice control first came about, if I was to ask you what year, any guesses what year voice control came about in BMW? Podcast listeners, what do you think? We were Let just talking know. about uh, 1994. So with the, with the whole steering wheel and everything integrated in the Drehdruckknopf, how many years? What do you think? Any guesses? Well, I can tell you. I can reveal. Give it to us. <laughs> Give it to us. It was 2001. So what's that? Uh, seven years later um, in yep. the BMW 7 Series E65. Now, the beauty of this was that BMW drivers could absolutely communicate suddenly with their car. Again, this is the first time this has ever happened. Um, and Amazing. this would be an absolutely sort of effortless communication when you wanted to do things like get your maps to work. So for navigation, you know, inputting where you want to go uh, is so much better, isn't it, than having to, where well, you obviously would have to stop, put it in um, into the center console instead. So to be able to do that through voice control was just brilliant and, and such a milestone, I think, in its own right. And that meant that the E65 became the first car on the market to fully embody the new BMW ergonomic principle of show up top, control down below. And I believe Ooh. there is a phrase in German, <laughs> but I'm going to leave that to you, Jonathan. <laughs> All own. right. So uh, show up top, control down below, uh, loosely translated in German is oben anzeigen, unten bedienen. I love it. Brilliant. <laughs> oben anzeigen, unten bedienen. Not bad. Not bad. <laughs> I mean, it's terrible. Considering how many years I've worked in Germany, I should be better at German by now. But anyway, that's a side note. <laughs> um, now, I think this concept, they really allowed the driver to keep their eyes on the road 
without ever having to look down at the controls on the instrument panel. So again, a new level in technology and innovation. And also everything was intuitively placed within the reach of your hand. So once again, back to what we said at the beginning, this had a clear logic in favor of what the driver needed, you know, putting the driver at the center of all the design. And then we have the iDrive, which really is the crown in the jewel of all of this. Um, And as a consequence, the E65 is now considered to be the real bearer of the first iteration of the modern driver-orientated cockpit. So actually, for the first time since 1975, a BMW was offered without some kind of geometrically angled instrument panel. So in fact, the concept which has found their way to drivers with that 1972 turbo that we talked about at the beginning um, and then later into production thanks to the 1975 3 Series were actually regarded as outdated. So it was goodbye to that. Um, And actually instead, the fourth generation of the iconic 7 Series limousine was given a completely symmetrical instrument panel when seen from above. So 2001 was a really big year for design revolution. Most definitely. And, you know, it just goes to show, you know, with with 2000, you know, going from 1999 to 2000, it was like, whoa, this new whole thing. And wow, look at what's going on. And then like, bam, BMW drops this. But not only this in 2001, but also in the 7 Series, another innovation was introduced. So you got double the money, double the fun. It marked the most radical shift thus far for BMW interior design, which was the introduction of the iDrive in the BMW 7 Series E6. Now, with design, it's either evolution or revolution, and this is totally revolutionary. This was a massive rethink design-wise, and, you know, what was once an increasingly complex operating system with all these buttons and all these things, it's now been transformed into a simple-to-use, ergonomic, and an intuitive alternative that just made sense. It put the drivers and the driving experiences first, and it was still the deciding factor in the design process. Like, I keep saying it's always about the driver and what they need. But researchers, they were faced with a bit of a dilemma. As cars became increasingly advanced, drivers had more distractions to handle. (laughs) Oh, yes, we all know that. (laughs) You know, this just makes sense. And we all know what this feels like. Just the other day, I was uh, driving in the car, listening to my music. And with my from the steering wheel, I could like flip to my different songs and like amp up the volume and all this stuff. And then a phone comes in. So, of course, I press on the steering wheel and I answer the call. And then I have to turn left and then I end the call. But I want to listen back to that second song I was listening to five minutes ago. So I have to click it back and then I have to park. I'm like, geez, even with all these awesomely innovative things within my steering wheel, still I'm getting distracted and still I need to keep my eyes on the road and, and be as safe as possible. So it and 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 we're in like 2021 right now, right? So before there were so many different things and they still had to had to narrow it down. So a, kim- a simple count showed BMW experts way back when in 2001 that drivers had to deal with 35 indicator elements, 35. Wow. And 65 <laughs> service elements from their seat. So this was <laughs> way too much. Thankfully, they introduced the now iconic iDrive controller and the adjacent iDrive control system to manage all the functionalities across the board right at the driver's right hand. That number could be reduced from 35 indicator elements to only 15, which is awesome, and from 65 service elements all the way down to 28, already making it much easier to use, very hands-on, and had some practical reasonings to boot. So, Interior designers, they were freed up to rethink the entire driving experience and approach to human car interaction. Now, I absolutely love this term, human car interaction. Like I keep saying over and over, it's all about the driver, right? And now we have a phrase that we can use, human car interaction. I absolutely love this. So the classical center console completely vanished. It was gone, right? And then in its place, a more open cockpit design was achieved, making the interior more luxurious and also spacious, making it feel like a proper cockpit. Not like you're driving a car, but you're starting to drive like a spaceship, which is kind of cool. Now, today, this breakaway moment is heralded as a stroke of genius for the designers and has come to define BMW interior design perhaps more than anything else. But... 
We are still not done with our history lesson. I could go on and on about human car interaction and design, but Nikki, we got to jump ahead a couple of years. Well, yeah, just a couple. So don't get too ahead of yourself, uh, but we are getting closer <laughs> to 2021. Uh, it's actually two years later from 2001 to 2003, because what happened then was we had the very first head-up display in a German production car, the BMW 5 Series, the E60. Now, head-up display or hood for short, um, I'm sure you've probably been in a car or maybe your car has one um, where it projects all the information that you need, particularly, I think, around maps and directions onto the windshield right in front of the driver's eye. It's an absolutely genius piece of technology. I absolutely yeah. adore it. And it's something I think that I have really started to rely on, you know, particularly for, for my work. I'm always darting off to new locations that I haven't been to before. So I rely very heavily on my navigation and on my maps. Mm. And you just don't want to be looking down or looking anywhere yeah. that isn't directly in front of you. And just having that head up display, again, takes another element away from the fact uh, that you might not have your eyes on the road. So it allows you to literally look ahead right in front of you on keep your eyes on the road but also you're getting that information uh, about the navigation or you know whether it's your speed whatever you have it set to um so I think that, uh, yeah, that is just a game changer for me personally. Um, I don't know if you feel, feel similar, Jonathan. He was passionate about a, a hood. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I like I remember the first like you and I were, were, you know, off on the go in different cities every week somewhere else. Right. So I remember the first time that I had this experience and I got into a newer rental car and I'm sorry, I can't remember what what type of car it was. I just knew I had to drive like two hours just to get the destination. And I didn't realize it at first. I'm starting to notice like all the features. I'm like, wait a minute, I can see how fast I'm going on the what? On the what? <laughs> this is so cool. It was it was one of those moments of like, whoa, technology again makes the cockpit feel more like a spaceship than an actual car. Do I remember what the make and model was? No. Do I remember where I was going? No. Do I remember what I was doing? No. But I remember that experience of my first head up display in a car and it was truly groundbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. It really is amazing, isn't it? Thank, thank God we have that. <laughs> exactly. Yet another cool feature. So let's fast forward a couple more years to 2018. We're almost there to the present day where things went totally digital. BMW Live Cockpit, BMW Operating System 7, and BMW Intelligent Personal Assistant, they're all proof of rapid development of a number of digital additions to the BMW in-cockpit experience. All right, so here's an example of this was just a little bit too much of information overload. So the replacement of analog gauges in favor of highly intuitive digital display technologies. This is this was groundbreaking, right? Yeah. So the yeah. Digital design combined 2D and 3D graphics, and it was tailored. Oh, I love that word. Tailored perfectly to the user's needs. Here I go again talking about the user's needs, right? Now, the aim is to focus the driver's attention to the given driving situation while always providing the relevant information. Now, this concept is called the BMW Live Cockpit, and it allows for an emotional and purest driver car interaction experience. And it makes, you know, just intelligent use of entirely digital display clusters, navigation, and entertainment systems. It's, it's truly groundbreaking. Now, these, in turn, they can be controlled and interacted with by using the iDraft controller or even gesture and uh, voice control, like we were talking about before, for the true multimodal operations and fast access people. So this is just totally future. And this was 2018, right? Yeah. So um, this just completely blows my mind. So let's talk about voice interaction for a second. The BMW Intelligent Personal Assistant, it gives the drivers an AI-powered personal co-driver, so cool, <laughs> which is capable of fulfilling a huge range of everyday driving needs and in-car functionalities through voice commands. Like, this is future stuff. And like I said before, this is in 2018 when this came out. So I must admit, talking about these things and saying this was just a couple of years ago, and this is what's, like, available now, 
I can't imagine what's going to be happening in the next 10 to 20 years. Oh, I know. That's the amazing thing, isn't it? But I mean, a personal assistant, I've always wanted a personal assistant. (laughs) This is the only personal assistant I will ever have in my life. But you know what? She's pretty good. (laughs) Yeah, she's She's pretty good at getting my radio on the right station that I need. (laughs) Um, And and again, going back to that, um, it's so funny. I always think back to when you used to have your, you know, traditional analog speedometer at the dashboard in front of you, you know, and then it was changed to a digital display. And I do remember sort of at the time thinking, oh no, why Why would you want a digital yeah. display? Like, oh yeah. my God, no, the old sort of like proper analog gauges are so much better. That's Let's stick with tradition on that. And now if you got into a car <laughs> with an old school mm-hmm. speedometer, it would just yeah. feel so alien. It would feel so yeah. archaic. And it's amazing how quickly we all move on. You know, when technology yeah. arrives, um, we're very, very adaptable and, you know, embrace it and sort of forget about what has been, what the past was. Um, 100%. And really get into the new. So speaking of new, where are we now and what comes next? (laughs) Well, to a certain extent, we kind of already know because, of course, this year is a big year for BMW, particularly with the launch of the all new BMW iDrive in 2021. Um, And that combines nearly 100 years of interior design, technology innovations, and engineering excellence all coming together. So that is super exciting. Um, And I think, you know, we've got to keep in mind that tomorrow's sort of ever more demanding driver, we do get more demanding, we can't deny Mm -hmm. it, Um, and now being (laughs) offered this sort of truly state-of-the-art driving experience, which is really geared towards, um, you know, an increasingly digital future. That is the way we're heading. Um, That's what we're all embracing. Um, And alongside the BMW iDrive, of course, is the all new BMW iX, which I've got to say, I have had the pleasure of driving and it is utterly phenomenal. The interior, the concept, the design, it is truly breathtaking. And I'm not just saying this because we're doing a podcast for BMW. It really is spectacular. It's something that I've kind of never seen before. Um, There's this, as soon as you get in, there's this amazing, it's a huge curved display. It's kind of floating above the dashboard. Um, Honestly, I think it's about 25 inches long. It is phenomenal. And that, of course, is where all your digital components are kind of bundled in. Um, It's got this amazing iX hexagonal steering wheel as well, which which gives you this kind of tunnel vision, you know, imagine sort of top part of a hexagonal, you know, you can then see straight in um, to see the sort of the digital display in front of you. Um, and, and it's fantastic because it's also got the BMW operating system eight. So that's a step up as well. Um, and then of course it's electric and it has a super duper range, yeah. but that's a side point. Um, <laughs> you know, if you look at the steering wheel there, I think the other thing about the iX is that, you know, as you mentioned earlier, Jonathan, some of the, some of the cars we've seen in the past had so many buttons, almost too many buttons. It was overwhelming. We didn't know if we were looking left, right, up, down, you know, there's too much going on. So this has actually kind of been stripped back down to the essentials. Um, So it's this got this really lovely kind of uncluttered cabin inside. Um, But that doesn't mean, of course, it does less. (laughs) It does way more than we've seen Mm. in any other car. It just means it's kind of all intellectually placed with certain buttons. Um, So there's more technology in the car than ever before, but it's just super minimalistic when it comes to buttons inside the car and what you can see. And, and BMW have come up with this term called shy tech, which I actually really know. I think, it, I think it's quite a cute term, um, shy tech, uh, sort of like shy technology. It's there, but you can't <laughs> see it. It's not like right yeah. in your face. Um, and that allows for the interior to be just, you know, really, really stunning. Um, and then, of course, you look into the materials that they've used. It's just a, a very beautiful car. So hopefully uh, you'll have the opportunity to test drive it too, Jonathan, very soon. <laughs> Would love that. Would love that. Um, Now, none of all of this that we've been talking about, of course, is a coincidence because this is almost 100 years of putting that driver in the driving seat. Back to what you were saying earlier, you know, Mm. that was the priority. And and throughout this whole journey, BMW has really engaged on this mission to create a sheer undistracted driving pleasure for 
anyone who takes the seat behind the wheel. Um, and, you know, there's <laughs> always attention to even just the slightest details. And that has really resulted in this design philosophy that champions drivers and their needs. And also, of course, takes into account how those demands have changed over time. Yeah. How we, you know, we demand so much in the driving seat now. We're, you know, mm-hmm. we're, we're busy working. You know, if I'm on a long drive, that's my office. <laughs> I'm yeah. there, you know, you're doing calls, you're listening to things, you're putting on podcasts, perhaps you're listening listening in your BMW on a drive now to our podcast. But, you know, that is the time uh, to actually get as much done as possible. You're not just there to drive. And that is why I think BMW has really kind of excelled across those 100 years and really pushed mobility into the future through wonderful, joyous experiences so that we can actually have fun in the car too. Exactly. You know, I think just to recap, I think it's it's fascinating, you know, talking about the first steering wheel, which was huge and was like like steering this ship. And now and and then halfway through, there was all these gadgets and buttons and then it became too much. And then we've gone back to the original, like you said, with shy tech, where everything is there, but you don't notice it, where everything's really sleek and streamlined because it is digital. Things are voice controlled. You don't need to press every button. You can just call it out. And I think that's such a beautiful full circle moment. Things go from analog to uh, to digital in this really minimalistic way. And I'm really excited to see how the future is going to continue to shift and change with uh, the steering wheel and controlling options. Yeah, actually, it's a very, very interesting question. Uh, where will we be in uh, 10, 20 years time? Exactly. I have no idea, but I'm sure the head of design at BMW does. <laughs> He's probably got a pretty good idea. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We'll have to do a part two on this on this podcast in yes. 10, 20 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, no, 10, 20 years. I was going to say, let's do a part two and get the head of BMW design yes. on the show. <laughs> we'll there you continue. go. <laughs> I can't <laughs> wait 10 to 20 years to find out (laughs) well thank you so much once again for listening to this week's episode of changing lanes yes it was a blast and if you enjoyed this episode make sure that you subscribe to our podcast for future episodes and of course if you do want to dive deeper into all things bmw or have a look at what we've been discussing today then do head on over to bmw.com because there is plenty of information to get stuck into and learn more Most definitely. I'm Jonathan Tilly. And I'm Nikki Shields. And this has been Changing Lanes. See you next time.